Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, you guys. Even though this video is premiering at the moment of you watching this, I am pre-recording this. And just a little secret between you and me and the whole of the internet, I was not planning on filming this video today. However, however, my friends, if you've been following along on this channel for a long time, or if you have been following along over on Aquarius Rising Africa, where we discuss these deep dives into these very suspicious historical figures, you will know that history, for better or for worse, whether the history we've been given is true or not, is one of my absolute favorite subjects. And just recently, I was in the last few months, I realized why history is one of my favorite subjects. History is nothing but an academic class of gossip. That's all history is. It's academic gossip. Where and what other academic subject, for example, can you literally have a full-on conversation about the fact that Catherine de Medici, the last queen of the Valois dynasty, put cow poo in her hoo-ha in order to attract her husband. If you missed that video, I will link it down below. Literally, guys, there are classes across the world in university, French history classes, where they literally talk about Catherine de Medici's hoo-ha. History is one of the most fantastic reality shows, days of our lives. It's one of the best, most entertaining, entertaining subjects we could ever, ever go into. And if you are a younger person watching this, hopefully you're not too young because we're not super appropriate on this channel. But if you're like a teenager or early 20s and you're in college, maybe, maybe, maybe me talking about history being a gossip class will hopefully change your perspective on history and hopefully it will help you enjoy that class a little bit more because this is some juicy, juicy stuff. Now, because I love this stuff and because I just want to gossip with you, I decided to go ahead and film this video. Even though today I was supposed to be cleaning the toilets, I've already done that though, and just doing some household work and finishing up some research, I literally was like, I gotta talk to someone. I've got I've got to I've got to spill the tea with someone. Even though right now, as I'm pre-recording, I'm talking to myself. I know that once this goes up on Monday, you guys will be able to respond to this, and I cannot wait to hear what you guys think of this juicy, 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 juicy tea that we have to talk about today. Now, with that being said, we right now are talking about the Romanov dynasty, that big old dynasty over in Russia that ruled for about 300 or so years. Now, if you've been following along since the beginning, you know that we ended, I'm going to talk about some juicy gossip. We ended 2023 talking about Rasputin and the cult that um, worships his lingam. Again, gossip. Like, there's a museum in Russia that still has, pickled in a jar, Rasputin's manhood. 
this is why history is fabulous. This is why it's fantastic. It is literally academic gossip. But anyway, I decided since we ended 2023 with Rasputin, I decided that we would start 2024 talking about the big, big conspiracy of Anastasia Romanoff, whether she survived the fated, ill-fated night in the early 20th century when the Bolkovich revolution allegedly took the lives of her and her family. But when I started to research just that one story, I realized that the Romanovs, the Romanovs, Listen, listen, y'all, if you think your family's crazy, I guarantee you they got nothing on the Romanovs. I mean, do you guys remember Catherine the Great's furniture when we covered her? Holy crap. So when I was studying Anastasia Romanoff initially, I realized we got to go back to the beginning. We got to talk about these people because, oh my God. God, like, oh my God, thank God this is not my family. I, I think anybody who has a lineage like this probably deserves a lifetime of free therapy because hello. But anyway, with that being said, I will link all of our past episodes on the Romanoffs down in the description box below in case you miss them. It's not necessary to go in order. However, if you would like to go in order, we did start with the original Anastasia Romanoff. The original, there was an original, which that's the beginning. And eventually when we're done with this series, we'll get to the end, which is the grand conspiracy of the more current Anastasia Romanoff. We have covered Peter the Great, the psychopath. I mean, wow, talk about a douchebag. Peter the Great. Um, we have covered Catherine the Great. And then last week, we talked about Paul, her son, whom I actually feel a little bit sorry for because I think Paul is like the poster child of PTSD. But today, we're going to be talking about Paul's oldest son, Alexander the First or Alexander the Blessed. Listen, ladies, listen, ladies, or men, if you happen to also date men. If the guy you're dating has been labeled the Blessed by his mother or his grandmother, I would say, in my opinion, run for the hills. Run for the hills! Like, Anyway, but we have to, we have to. I thought after we covered Captain the Great, of course, we had to cover her son, Paul, because he brought the Knights of Malta, the ultimate secret society into Russia. Juicy, juicy, juicy. Again, that episode's down below in the description box if you want to hear about that, that juicy stuff. All the secret society stuff is super juicy, right? Like, what are they doing? Like, what's the secret? Like, what are they doing that's so secret? Anyway, I digress. Then I thought, oh, we'll just go ahead and skip over to Anastasia Romanoff. But every time I think I'm just going to go ahead and fast forward to the main event, the grand conspiracy, I find even more stuff. I find even more tea that I just want to talk to you guys about because, wow, another good thing on a more serious note about history. And the reason why we do study history, assuming that the history we've been giving is correct, which, again, I, I question that now, but that's a topic for a different day is so that history doesn't repeat itself, which it most likely more times than most does repeat itself because we're dumbasses and we just don't, we're idiots. And so we repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And this is what's so freaking fascinating again about the Romanoffs. Not only are the Romanoffs batshit crazy, but, but we love it. We love it. We're here for it. Um, but they have so many conspiracies. It's not just Anastasia Romanoff, y'all. It's like everyone has a conspiracy. There are so many people in the Romanoff family starting at the very, very, very beginning that have allegedly faked their own deaths. You know, here we are in 2024 and we're being told that like half of the people we think are gone are not gone and people who are here are actually gone and all this like crazy making that's happening. Literally, it's crazy making and all. We, we, I think we have some grand idea that we're like enlightened and we're, the, we're awakened because we know all these conspiracies. Y'all, this has been done before. It's been done before. We're going to talk about it today. Another conspiracy about the Romanovs where somebody was like, yeah, I don't think I want to do this anymore. So I'm going to go fake my death. Um, we're going to talk about it today because as I've said, 
as I've said, as much as I love to know truth, as long as I, as much as I love to talk about these conspiracies, in, a, in all seriousness, in order to be awake, to tr be truly be awake, it, it, it's more of a spiritual thing, right? This stuff, this stuff is just the drama. This stuff is just the tea. And so all the stuff we hear today about whether certain people are alive or not, that's just drama. That's just tea. Like that's not really have, does that have anything to do with you personally and your own spiritual development, right? So let's talk about it. Hopefully we can enjoy this. We can enjoy this conspiracy. We can enjoy this story. We can gossip about this story. And hopefully the more on a more serious note, the more we learn that this has all been done before, the more we can pull back from the delusional thinking and start to really work on ourselves. Right. While also, you know, enjoying some gossip every now and again. <laughs> I mean, you guys know I love my reality TV. I love watching my housewives. I love watching Vanderpump Rules. I've been a diehard Vanderpump Rule watcher since the very beginning. So Scandaval, I was all about it when it was happening. That's that's the other part of me. And so discussing these historical events, it's just like an episode of Vanderpump Rules, y'all. Right? That's all it is. So let's get into it, you guys. But before we get into it, I do want to acknowledge and thank my patrons and my producers here on Esoteric Atlanta because, as always, without you guys, we would not be able to keep the lights on here in Atlanta, Georgia, where we do our, our deep dive in into the wonderful world of gossip. If you would like to join our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. And I also want to give a special shout out to Gnostic TV, which is another sponsor of this channel. You guys know that I have a couple of series over on Gnostic TV. I have the Esoteric Explorer series, which is a, another deep dive into gossip. But of course, there we don't have to deal with things like censorship or shadow banning. So I'm able to speak more freely about my research over on Gnostic TV. I also have a series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Health and Wellness series, where we basically go through all of my education for all the years that I spent in India. And I really try to help you in each episode start to understand understand your your own self better the, the the true awakening right the true awakening to who you truly are in your spirit and your consciousness um through all the all all, all the subjects the chakras um friction prakriti parusha yoga we've got, I've got exercise videos on there all sorts of stuff so if you guys want would like to join gnostic tv there is a link down in the description box below all right let's get to the good stuff so Alexander the First, or Alexander the Blessed, was born on December 23rd, 1777, and allegedly, allegedly died on December 1 of 1825. He was the son of Emperor Paul and his second wife, the grandson of Catherine the Great. Alexander wasn't necessarily a mama's boy. He was more of a grandmama's boy. I mean, Catherine the Great doted on Alexander like no other mother in the world. She coddled this little boy. In fact, she gave all of the love to Alexander that she could never give to her son, Paul. And again, if you refer back to our episode on Paul and the Knights of Malta, you will learn more about the turbulent relationship that Catherine had with her one and only son, Paul. Well, here's the thing. We talked about this with Paul. The reason why, one of the reasons why Catherine did not have a great relationship with her son, Paul, was because her aunt-in-law, the Empress Elizabeth, had taken Paul from her after she had given birth. And, and the Empress Elizabeth basically took Paul as her own. And then Catherine turned around and did that to Paul and took Alexander as like her her own little muse, her own little mini me. So it's like it's like that family trauma, right? It's like family wounds that keep repeating themselves over and over and over and over again. She was super overprotective of Alexander. Whereas Alexander's father, Paul, was neglected a lot as a child. In fact, again, there were stories where Paul would fall out of his crib and like no one would come get him. And he they would come and find him in the morning just like on the floor. But in the flip, Alex was like, I'm going to call him Alex because that just sounds more natural. Alex was like, absolutely just like, talk about like a helicopter parent. Like he was coddled. He was just, it was just too much. It was too much. His grandmother just was obsessed with him. In fact, his grandmother actually named him. I have my thoughts on that. 
I get it. Like I get their family pressures with names, at least in, in some in my family that it was that way. Like I have a huge issue. Just a little personal note. Like I have a huge issue with my own name. Um, I I my name Bryce is my mother's maiden name, and it's a family name. I my sister and I, all of my cousins, we all have family names that you just did not in my generation. Like you did not give your kid a name that was not in the family, right? And I really like question like why my parents did that to me. There were tons of family names they could have picked from that were feminine. And I, I kind of like have a bit of a grudge against my parents because like they didn't think about the fact that I was going to have to live with this name as a female. But I don't feel, but because it is a family name and, and because it is my mother's maiden name and I love my mother's family, I love my, my grandparents, um, I don't feel like I, I can change it because I feel like that would be disrespectful. So, you know, basically like, like in my opinion, the moral of the story is like, be careful what you name your children. Like you might think a name is fun or interesting, but think about that child. Like that child's got to live with that name for the rest of their lives. I would give anything to have a female name, anything. Like I, I have such trauma around my name and I like, I, I just, I want to know why my parents did this to me. That's anyway, story for a different day. But with Alex, I, I see like his grandmother came in and she named him and she named him after Alexander the Great. Y'all, we've gossiped about Alexander the Great. I will also include that video down in the description box below because we know, I know, you know, my uh, tea spillers. Alex the Great was a cannibal. <laughs> like that man was so deprived and deranged. He was he was the person who brought in like secret societies where they do funky parties. If you guys know what I'm talking about, like these parties that many celebrities are now coming out and talking about, like these types of parties, like parties I don't want to go to, like eyes wide. Shut stuff, you know, like that's what Alexander the Great did. He was a cannibal again, um, and he did bad things to children and um in a very flamboyant funeral. Again, I will include that episode down in the description box below because talk about some juicy, juicy stuff. So Catherine the Great, who historically has a reputation for not being saintly or virtuous. Like, can we, again, can we talk about the furniture that she had? Um, She's now naming her first grandson after somebody who was a cannibal and who also had weird little parties and drank a substance that came from the human body. I can't say it on YouTube. You guys know what I'm talking about? That substance. So you're naming your grandson after this monster. Interesting, right? Parents have nothing to say about it. That's who he is. He's Alexander. He is the grandson of Catherine the Great, not the son of Paul. He's known as the grandson of Catherine the Great. And again, she just coddles him. Like she is all over him like white on rice you guys like she just this is child is her obsession it is said that at a very very young age because alexander was just so he was the blessed right he was the golden child where paul was the scapegoat alexander was the golden child and because he just was so fond over in the court, it is noted that at a very young age, Alexander started to show signs that he was actually going to be really good at politics. He was able to do things like he was able to get people to tell them everything about themselves, him everything about themselves, like spill their deepest, darkest secrets to Alexander. And Alexander would like not react. Like he was really good at hiding his emotions and he wouldn't tell them anything about 
himself. I mean, I kind of know people talk about this trait. I I'm sure you've had people like this in your life too. People that just like can get information out of you, but then tell you nothing about themselves and they show you no reaction. And on top of that, people started realizing that at a very young age, Alexander, Alex, he started to learn how to also manipulate emotion. So not only would he not show emotion, but when he needed to, when it served him, he could manipulate emotion. <laughs> from all intent and purposes, from a very young age, it was quite clear that Alex was going to be a great czar. Now, we know from our previous episode, our previous two episodes, that Catherine actually wanted to, like, write Paul out of the will. Like, not let her son be czar. And give it to Alex, her grandson. We kind of saw that with Queen Elizabeth, right? People were speculating that Queen Elizabeth would like skip over Charles and go straight to William. That didn't happen. But with Catherine, we do know that she had actually planned to do this. And she died before it could come to fruition. So when she died, Paul like ran to her secret files of wills and like destroyed the will so that he could become the czar again go back and watch that episode if you missed it but nonetheless paul throughout his life was showing signs that he was going to be quite a good politician quite a good a good ruler however around his teenage years he started to express concerns like he didn't want to be the czar in fact i have it written down here he said in one of his letters to his friends, y'all, he said, I swore to myself to refuse it one way or another. Now, this is foreshadowing. So yes, foreshadowing for sure. Alex, our friend Alex here, even though he's got the wherewithal and the intelligence to obviously rule and be a politician like he's had to survive with his grandmother Catherine the Great he's obviously learned from her he doesn't want it like he in, in most of his letters to his friends he, he even says like he doesn't think that he is worthy of the position destined to him he doesn't want to be a prince he doesn't want to be the czar but grandma wants to like give him the czardom and skip his dad but he actually like loves his dad, which is really interesting. And that's going to kind of come into the story later down the line. Now, we know with the Romanovs, especially the men in the Romanov line, we have a history of mental disorders. We know Paul, as I said, I believe that Paul had severe PTSD. I think he had what we call now in 2024 complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD. We know that he suffered from paranoia. We know that his father, Peter III, the one that Catherine, you know, kicked off the throne, he was severely mentally disturbed. We also know that Peter the Great, who is Alexander's great-great-grandfather, was a literal psychopath. Like, was a literal narcissistic psychopath, a narcopath, as my therapist used to call them. So we have this history of extreme mental disorders. And for the most part in Paul's childhood, it wasn't apparent that he had the same mental disorders that his predecessors had had. Like, for, he seemed like a pretty well-adjusted, grounded kid. However, if, if you are familiar with the channel HG Tutor, I will tag it down below. It's a fantastic channel. It's this guy who claims to be a narcissistic psychopath, and he talks a lot about this disorder, this mental, you know, the way that they are. And he says something in a lot of his videos that... When it comes to being a narcissist, for example, you could have the narcissistic gene, but it could never be triggered. So someone can go throughout their whole life and be a normal person with the narcissistic gene, but the narcissistic gene is just never triggered. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with Alex. I think with Alex, he had the obvious leaks. We're, we're going to get into it, guys. Like, I'm, I'm talking about this for a reason. Like, he had the gene to be mentally disturbed schizophrenic i know that's what a lot of scholars believe whatever was going on with his family he had that gene i just don't think that it was triggered for a while and in fact the first triggering we see of this this gene is uh when he was a young kid like a young kid like like, like a teenager um he um was 
working with the military and a cannon went off actually at this side went off by his left ear and it was too close to his ear so he went deaf in his left ear and because he went deaf in his left ear he had this growing sense of paranoia that kind of snowballed his whole whole life like he would hear courtiers and like his people laughing in the halls and they might be laughing about something completely like just a joke they, they told and he would get paranoid that they were laughing at him and listen like I kind of get it because like I can't hear I, I've talked about that a lot I have really bad hearing uh, my boyfriend gets mad at me a lot because he'll say like I'm yelling when I, I don't think I'm yelling like I think I'm just talking normally and um, but I've always had really bad hearing I I do listen to my music pretty loud too. Um, and I did live in Los Angeles for a very long time and was in the hanging around the big music spots. And so I did have stereos and the equipment in my ear, but I kind of get that. Like it, it sucks when you can't totally hear something, um, especially when you're in a situation where somebody is speaking lightly and you're constantly having to like really focus on what they're saying to hear what they're saying or you're having to say like pardon or excuse me or can you repeat it does start to get to you so I get it I, I get it with Alex I get it but my lack of hearing has not it's not made me schizophrenic his just kind of uh, what happens is it, it tends to it, it seems like it, it grows this gene of paranoia that's already there and, and and in fairness too you guys like in fairness too he's part of a royal family he's part we know we know we know that the royal families aren't like other families like they will they will unalive each other in a heartbeat to get what they want so i think anybody born within the chaos of a royal family is going to already have a a, a sense of like righteous paranoia like i'm not i'm not shaming them for that like holy crap you know go watch game of thrones like and that's literally what this is, is game of thrones so i just think that the you know it was like the perfect storm so he's already starting to kind of show signs but it's more like again like social stuff like he thinks people are laughing at him you know as as at this point in his young adulthood and it, around the age of 15 we see that Catherine allows Alex to kind of pick his wife. She she lets him choose between two sisters. And he ends up picking Louise, the oldest sister. And she is a princess of Barden, this territory of Barden. And she agrees and she converts to Russian Orthodoxy and she takes the name Elizabeth. So around the age of 16, Alex and Elizabeth get married. And this happens on October the 9th of 1793. Now, again, Elizabeth is two years younger than Alex. So Alex is six, 16. This makes Elizabeth 14 years old. 14 years old. Your brain isn't even done developing <laughs> until you're in your mid-20s. And at this point, obviously, the father, Paul, is still, Catherine is still alive. Catherine is still czarring. You know, she's still alive. She doesn't pass away until 1796, right? So Elizabeth, now her name is Elizabeth, she moves to Russia to be Alex's wife, the future czarina of Russia. And um, she's beautiful. Like, she is this drop-dead gorgeous woman and she not only is she beautiful physically but it is said that she was also very virtuous and very kind and very soft-spoken in fact you guys she was so pretty and i don't really understand this so if someone can explain this to me please do but men in the court would form like clubs around her beauty and their love for her I don't know how I would feel about that. I mean, I might be flattered. It's always flattering when somebody compliments you, but you're going to form a club around the way I look. And it's going to inspire your love. It's that's a little stalkerish. That's kind of weird. Like, that's, I don't know. And you're 14 at that. Like, you're 14. Well, Paul, we know at this point, Alex's father, Catherine's son, Paul is, like, deep in his issues, his trauma. And he wasn't very nice to Elizabeth. Like, she had a lot of 
pent up anxiety because Paul would like berate Elizabeth. And I have empathy for Elizabeth in this situation because my dad would do the same thing. Like my dad, I, and I released a video the other day kind of talking a little bit about this, but my dad was really like paranoid about my sister and me being snobs or feeling entitled, which we never were. So we never were those things, but he would like beat us down because of it so that we would be humble, right? And, and all that turned into was me having massive trauma and me being abused as a child. So the same thing kind of happened to Elizabeth, but from her father-in-law. So on once, on one hand, you've got this court that's like fawning over you. And on the other hand, your father-in-law is like verbally assaulting you. And meanwhile, you're new to the country. Like you're learning the language. You're having to adjust. You've just married this guy, this kid that you don't really know, you know, it's a political marriage. In fact, even though Alex was also pretty good looking, like he's one of the best lookings, like the Romanoffs weren't that, they weren't that cute. Like, you know, they were kind of inbred, like they weren't that cute. Royalty typically isn't that cute. But Alex was pretty good looking. I, I can say that for his age, he was pretty good looking. And she was beautiful. So they're kind of this like, you know, poster child, this, you know, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston back in the day, you know, kind of this like, you know, this, this, um, you know, everybody wants to be around them, wants to be with them. But over time, they kind of like grow apart because they're, they're not really, you know, there's a political marriage. So it's not like it's a love marriage. And so, and I will say, like, I, I really like their relationship. We'll get more into it. I can't really explain it, but I do like their relationship. They're just like besties. They become like besties. And out of everyone in the court, even though they're not in love with each other, and oddly, they don't even lust after each other, even though they're both really good looking, they seem to really kind of have each other's backs. So even though they're not in love, they do, both of them do take on other lovers. They're really close. They're really close. Like, they're besties. And um, with them... We'll go ahead and just cover this. They did have two children themselves. Both of the children did not live very long. So Alex himself had like six other kids with his mistresses. But obviously these are not, you know, in the in the line of the blood that takes the crown. So they don't count. So it's not like they were infertile. They did obviously have two children that didn't survive past infancy. And then he had these six other kids that were, you know, I hate to use the word bastard, but that's what that's the word they used back then. Um, they were with his mistresses. So with that being said, Elizabeth and Alex never had their after their two children passed away. They didn't have any heirs of of their own, which which we'll get into a little bit later in the story about who then takes the, the crown after Alex. But anyway. I digress. So he's married at 15 to this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman. His grandmother dies like three years later. His father then takes over the throne. And again, that's Paul. And Paul is, you know, just very mentally disturbed. And we know that Paul's reign was very short. In fact, Paul was assassinated on March 11th of 1801. And Alex knew that his father, what they, so Alex knew that the powers that be, the, 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 you know, the people around the czar, the advisors, the nobles were going to try to get Paul to abdicate the throne. And that's what Alex supported. We talked about this last week. Alex was like, okay, I understand like the country's falling apart. I don't really want to be the czar. Like in all honesty, like I don't want to do this, but like the country is falling apart. And I know that I've, I've been educated to do this. So like, just get my dad to abdicate so I can, you know, try to try to save this, this country. And the nobles were like, sure, sure, Alex, we'll, we'll just get him to abdicate. Well, of course, that didn't happen. Paul was unalived. And now, boom, Alex is now the czar. He's the kingiest of kings. He's now the czar. As emperor, Alex revoked a lot of his father's decrees. He restored the rights and privileges to the nobles. He wanted to reform the empire in the name of enlightenment. He put together a group of young 
educated men to advise him. These young men were educated in Europe. And like his great-great-grandfather, Peter, he wanted more of a Western approach to his reign. Through this new group of advisors, Russia was rebuilt. Universities became available to everyone. Censorship laws were relaxed. And serfs now had the opportunity to potentially buy their freedom if their owners allowed it. This created a new class of people in Russia called the freed plowers. Now we know that in 1798, from last week's episode, two years into Paul's reign, so we're backing up a little bit, Napoleon Bonaparte had taken over the island of Malta. And because of that, the Knights of Malta had to regroup and find a new home. And so Paul, Alex's dad, had invited the Knights of Malta to come and live in Russia. And this made Paul the 72nd Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. So during this time of now Paul dying in 1801 and, and Alex becoming the new czar, the kingiest of kings, who doesn't even want to be there in the first place. He's like invited to a party he doesn't want to go to. We've also got in the background of this mess, Napoleon. We got Napoleon doing the Napoleon things. Um, Napoleon everywhere. He was just, you know, taking over Europe. And um, I've talked about Napoleon in a lot of stories, actually, in my New Orleans playlist, Nefarious New Orleans, which I will put down in the description box below the whole playlist. I talk a lot about Napoleon because Napoleon played a huge part in the United States history because of the Louisiana Purchase. So we've got this problem. We've got this guy named Napoleon Bonaparte, who is just going all over Europe. Just he probably had a small wiener. You know, just got to go, like, lift his leg and pee on everything. And he crowns himself, Napoleon, that is, crowns himself the emperor of France on the 2nd of December, 1804. Now, now, my friends, Napoleon was born out of the French Revolution. Like, he was part of this, like, French Revolution, which no one revolutions like the French do. Like, let me tell you something. Like, the French know how to throw a freaking revolution. But he is one of the reasons why the French Revolution at the end started to un unravel itself because you go from like one dictator to another dictator, right? It, it's, it's, we got to learn from these mistakes. So in this new revolution that we're kind of in globally, we can like not have the same thing happen again, where we just go back into a, a, another, another control mechanism. But from Alex's perspective, that would be very stressful. Like, here you are, you're the czariest of czars, and you don't want to be, you, like, don't want to be the czariest of czars, but you have to be the czariest of czars because you were born the first of, like, ten children. That's your birth order. So, like, boom. You got to do it. Your dad was a mess. You really, you know, initially, in the start of your Zardom, you you want to bring a more liberal approach to your reign. You you want to educate your people. You want to relax the censorship laws. You do restore the rights of the nobles. And I, I really thought about that a lot. Like we we need rich people. You know, his father like really hated the nobles. I don't blame him because the nobles end up unaliving him. So I get I get there was tension there. Um, but you do need rich people. Like we need rich people. A poor man's never given me a job. Like, we do need people that can economically employ others, let's just say. So there's, we're in a time of, like, you know, during this time, too, if we look especially at the American Revolution just happened. America's a fledgling country over there. The first country to not have, over here, I'm an American, not to not have a monarchy. Like, there's just so much going on in the world. And as I've said with Catherine the Great, like, planetarily, astrologically, what was going on then? is also going on now. So we see a lot of similarities of what's happening or what was happening on a bigger scale. But for Alex's, because that's who we're that's who we're gossiping about right now. For for Alex's perspective, like that would be really stressful. Like, like you you're the czar of like one of the biggest empires in the world and you got Napoleon on your back 
back door and you like don't even want to be here anyway. So with that being said, with all the stress of Napoleon, we see Alex, like, he goes off to war, he fights some battles, he's not really good on the battlefield, bless his heart, he probably wasn't that athletic, and so he decides he's going to let the military people do their job, he's just going to worry about politicking. Now, again, I've said many times before, I'm not a military channel, I don't find a lot of joy in military history, I only talk about what's necessary to tell the story on this channel, but there are a lot of really great military channels out there if you would like to look more into the Napoleonic Wars and what happened with Alex and spe more specifically Russia. But there is one thing that we've got to talk about, and this was something that happened in 1807. So in 1807, Alex and Napoleon decide that they're going to have a little meeting and they're going to try to negotiate like a peace treaty. Sounds great, right? But of course, they didn't just meet on some battlefield or like at someone's house over coffee. They were extra. They went to a little river and Napoleon's troops were on one side and Russia's troops were on the other side and they constructed a freaking raft and i don't mean like raft is probably a bad way to describe this it was like this austin like it was like this this like floating pavilion <laughs> that was constructed specifically for this meeting why does royalty do this this isn't like like that we like in French history, in English history, when Henry VIII goes to France to meet the King of France to negotiate his daughter Mary's engagement to the Dauphin of France, and that didn't work out. But anyway, they go and they, they like create this like village of like carpets and gold just for this one meeting. Or like you, I know Marie Antoinette didn't really say, "Well, let them eat cake," but it's just that, like, like you live in a different world, like you live in a different reality. Like, what do you mean you built basically like a floating stage for a two-hour meeting? The audacity, the audacity of these royals. Alex, 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 listen, buddy, you got freaking people starving in your home country. You still, even though you're trying to reform the serfdom, you still got serfs, which are slaves. And you're building a floating pontoon boat. That's probably nicer than most people's houses for a two hour meeting with a man, Napoleon, who probably had a very small wiener. Like, let's just be honest. Why else would Napoleon do what he did? Gotta prove his manhood somehow, right? But anyway, guys, I had to tell you guys about that because it's just so extra. So they signed this peace treaty. It was all about, like, them agreeing to work with them against England. And it's just military stuff that I just uh, don't find interest in. Again, there's other channels that you can, you can listen to to get more details about the military stuff, but the peace treaty doesn't really last that long. They never do, do they? <laughs> Around this time, though, and, and I, I, I get it. I get it, Alex. I totally get it. He was so stressed out, like so stressed out, about everything going on that he didn't even want to be a part of that his paranoia started to get even worse. And he started to become even more paranoid about his father's own death and the role that he potentially played in his father's own death because he knew that they were going to do what they did. Many historians do believe that Alex had schizophrenia. I don't know. I'm not a therapist. I just know that these Romanoff men are all a little wackadoo and have some really crazy delusions. But there are a lot of people in the world that are a little wackadoo and have some crazy delusions. Have you been on Telegram lately? So I'm not really judging. I just like this is just hot gossip for this story. So Alex is starting to basically fall apart mentally. He um, 
his popularity kind of goes up and down. Like at one point he becomes really popular, like a list celebrity, like Brad Pitt popular, but then he's not popular anymore. Like it's just kind of going up and down. And again, I'm going to reiterate, he doesn't even want to do this job. Like he doesn't even want to be here. Like his, his father, Paul wanted the job. His grandmother, Catherine wanted the job. Like he don't want the job. He don't want the job. He doesn't want it. And he's having to do it. So I think that burnout and that aggression on top of the fact that you already have the propensity to have paranoid schizophrenia is making things a lot worse. Around this time, Alex starts going back. He starts backtracking. Because in the beginning, remember you guys, in the beginning, he wants to like relax the censorship laws. He wants to have education for everyone. These are sound like pretty good ideas. He wants to give the slaves, the serfs, an opportunity to like be free. You know, these all seem to be pretty, pretty good ideas. And then all of a sudden, he starts becoming tyrannical. He's like, heavier censorship. You can't say these words. And all these free thinkers in Russia, these philosophers, these people who have these grand ideas, this group of people who, who are educated in Europe that he relied upon to advise him because of their progressive thought, he now starts to, like, follow them. He starts to, like, have people follow them. With that being said, I just want to give a shout out to the three-letter agency person who's following me. Because <laughs> I know I know, I got someone following me. All you guys watching probably got a three-letter agency man following you too. So, because <laughs> so, we're free thinkers, right? We challenge the status quo. You know, we're anti-censorship. We're, you know, all the things that Paul was initially and now he's not anymore. So... He's just making enemies everywhere. And I think I personally think that his more tyrannical behavior, his need to censor more, his need to like stalk his friends who are free thinkers is because of his paranoia. I don't think it has anything to do with any grand conspiracy as far as like the NWO or like, you know, God or Lucifer or whatever. I think it's just strictly his own mental craziness, his crazy making, honestly. So, because at this point, like, dude is, like, seriously needs to be medicated at this point. Like, he is, so I, I don't think any of these actions he's taking are, are with him thinking about the betterment of his people. I think it's more his mental disorder or is making these decisions, if, if that makes sense. As Alex starts to go down this slippery slope, Elizabeth, his wife, his bestie, she really starts to step in and help him. And she does help him a lot. In fact, this is why I kind of love their relationship. Because, again, even though they're not, like, boinking each other and they're not, like, attracted to each other or in love with each other, they still do. Even though they're not in love with each other, they love each other, right? And Alex had said many times to his friends as well that he wished that he and Elizabeth could just go live in some quiet little town by themselves. So even though Alex wasn't intimate with Elizabeth nor was he attracted to her that way he still loved her enough and trusted her enough that the one person that he wanted to go like live in a small little house by a river quietly by himself was Elizabeth like she he wasn't interested in bringing any of his mistresses he wanted her with him and I think that's kind of sweet I think that there is definitely a sweetness to that relationship even though they were not living as man and wife should live um, they still really loved each other. And I think out of every, all the players in the story, I think that their relationship is the only relationship that has a sense of true love. Even though they, again, weren't intimate, they really cared for each other. And when she saw that he was really struggling mentally, she just stepped in and she just really was with him and tried to help him work through this mental stuff that he was going through. And around this time too, sadly, as they say, we'll get into it, maybe not, but as they say, Elizabeth develops tuberculosis. That was a big thing back, back then. And so uh, Alex at this time is like, okay, the one person in this whole world that I actually love has tuberculosis. And this was not good at this time period. Absolutely not good. So what what do we know? People who have tuberculosis or had tuberculosis back in this time, they were usually told to get out of cities. They needed to go be in fresh air. And so Alex is like, okay, okay, we're going to go now. Like, we're going to leave. 
St. Petersburg. And we're going to go to the south of Russia to a town called Taganrog. And we're going to like live there. And and I, I find this this part of the story really sweet because Alex like packs up. He moves them to the south of Russia. He cleans out the house. They say he swept the house himself. How adorable. He swept the house himself. It was a smaller house. He put all the furniture in its place. He really got the, cell, the, the house ready and set for Elizabeth. Elizabeth came down. And for two months, they basically lived in this town as just private citizens. They would read stories to each other every day from their favorite books. They would pray together. They would walk around the town and just chat with the locals like no big deal. Like they were just one of the people. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. However, there's one problem. Alex is still the czar. Our boy, our boy Alex, he has literally gone to this town and just living this beautiful life. But he's still the czar. Like he forgot. Like... Oh yeah, like like you got you're like the CEO of your own country. So and he's just like you know what I'm just gonna go just gonna I don't want to do this anymore. I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. So he's kind of dealing with this be because what's happening now because he is bizarre, but he's not czaring. Is revolts are starting to happen? Like a civil war is like literally looming in Russia because Alex just decided I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move to this. Just gonna, I'm just gonna be normal. I'm just gonna live a normal life. And um, Alex had expressed to some friends that he thought, since he had been the czar for like 25 years, that like by this time it had been like 25 years, that he should retire. He should just get to retire. He's like, you know, the military guys get to retire. But with that being said, the military guys weren't even liking Alex at this point. And here's why. I want to I want to express this too, because in Alex's paranoia and delusions, he did something good, but it kind of turned bad. Like he made these like military bases like we have now where people's family, like the military men their family could come live with them. But but if the family had a child who was a boy, at the age of seven, that boy was required to enlist in the military and therefore by law by the age of seven these boys were no longer no longer governed by their parents but by the state does that ring a bell so even though alex is down in the south of russia living out his fantasy with elizabeth of just being a normal person he's neglected the fact that he's the czar and he's made a mess and people are pissed. They're pissed. But, but two months into this little hiatus, Alex gets typhus. For those who don't know what typhus is, it's like a gnarly fever. It's a gnarly fever with rashes. We don't really get it that much anymore, but like he died. He died of typhus. Oops. Oops. This kid who never wanted to be the czar anyway started off on a good run, but got more and more and more paranoid because he's got a family history of this. Um, finally living the life he wants to live. And then, oops, he gets typhus and dies. Now, once again, I said earlier that Elizabeth and Alex did not have any surviving children. So, obviously, it's going to go to the next brother in line. It's going to go to Alex's brother. But, but, the interesting thing is that Alex had already talked to his brother, Nicholas, about Alex abdicating to Nicholas. So, there is evidence that Alex was not planning on holding on to the throne for very much longer anyway. So, the news breaks that Emperor Alex I, Alex the Blessed, has died at the age of 47 of typhus. And then six months later, Elizabeth, his wife, died too of tuberculosis. And then almost immediately, y'all, y'all, almost immediately, there was conspiracy theories that he had faked his death. 
And the crazy thing about this conspiracy theory, and this is why it's so juicy, is that this conspiracy is still debated today among scholars because there is a lot of proof that he might have faked his death. Like, a lot of proof. And this comes in a man named Fyodor Kuzmik. Now, Fyodor Kuzmik was a hermit that lived in the south of Russia. He greatly resembled Alex. He spoke multiple languages, which typically only happened if you were royalty. He also was deaf in his left ear. He was the same height, same build as Alex. And even to this day, scholars pour over the two signatures, the one of Fyodor and the one of Alex. And that is something that is undeniable. Even scholars who doubt the conspiracy have to say it's the same handwriting. Fyodor also refused to speak about his earlier life. It is also believed that his wife, Elizabeth, faked her death as well. And she spent the rest of her days as a nun. Now, Fyodor died in 1864. And if Fyodor was actually Alex, that means that he lived into his late 80s because he was born in 1777, which was a pretty long life for a person, assuming that that was Alex. And I just think how interesting, like how interesting, again, as I started off this episode, like we somehow think that we're the first generation to have like all these conspiracy theories. No, we're not. No, we're not. There's nothing new under the sun, my friends. There is nothing new under the sun. This has been done before. This has all been done before. This has all been done before. All right, you guys. So as always, please join us over at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern time on Aquarius Rising Africa. We're going to discuss this again with Shanti and you guys can participate live in that conversation. Let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. What do you think? Do you think he faked his death? Or do you think he actually died and this was just a, a silly conspiracy theory? What do you think? All right, y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you are in the United States of America today, we do have an eclipse and I know at 3.04 p.m. my time, we're going to be putting our little sunglasses in and going and watching it because it's going to get dark in Atlanta. It's supposed to get, the darkness is supposed to be between 82 and 85%. So we're, I, this is the second time in seven years this has happened. So if you're also in a country that's going to be able to observe the eclipse, eclipse let me know what you think, what happened in your country. And um, yeah, yeah. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you later. Bye.